build him. We have the technology. We have the capability to make the world's first bionic man. Good, good, good morning. It's good to see you guys this morning. Some of my friends wanted to join me up here on stage. I don't know if you can see them here, but uh, uh, Tom Hanks came. Uh, Jimmy Ridley, you're hiding next to the queen. I'm not sure. You're kind of ducking behind her here. Not sure what that's about. And Gina, one of our many healthcare workers here at our church, has joined us on the stage today. Don't worry, Bob. I'm going to use you as an example here in a minute. So today we're finishing our series. Now, we skipped it for two weeks. When we started this series, we were living like normal people, like everyone else. And we're talking today about Colossians. Now, let me tell you about the book of Colossians real quick. So the book of Colossians was written by Paul, who wrote much of the New Testament. Paul, if you remember, was the Pharisee of Pharisees. He was an incredible Pharisees, he, Pharisee, but he actually early on even was part of killing and arresting Christians. And even part of the first deacon, Stephen Stoning. And anyway, so Paul, when he writes this, has now, he's become a Christian. He gave his life to Christ. He was confronted by Christ himself. And Paul is in jail. Actually, at this point, you ready for this? He's on house arrest in Rome. Many of us relate to how Paul felt. So while we're watching, binge watching Netflix and Lion King or Lion Guy or Tiger Guy or something, Paul, instead of doing that, was writing much of the New Testament. So here he is in Rome. He's seeing some things going on in the church of Colossae. He sees some great things, a really neat church, but he also knows there's some difficulties there. And so today I'm going to talk about this idea of being fully devoted. It's chapter 4. Some of the commentaries barely cover chapter 4 because there's a lot of names. But we're going to talk a little bit about a few of the names. I'm not going to talk about all of them. But I want to give you some very practical advice today about how to live a devoted life. Because here's the deal. Do you want to live a life that matters? You know, even when you're in quarantine, even when you, maybe your whole life has changed. And by the way, a change of life like this makes you tired. Just so you know, anytime you have a rapid change, it takes our minds a little while to get used to it. And so even in the middle of this, listen, do you want to make the most of your life? And so today I'm going to talk a lot about this crock pot. And I'm going to talk about things that go in this crock pot. And we're going to look at three things if you want to live a life devoted to Christ. And as we look at those three things, I'm going to compare it to how we use a crock pot. Because here's the deal with a crock pot. We love our crock pot food. But you have to get the crock pot ready. You can't wait till uh, uh, time for dinner and then say, oh, got to turn the crock pot on. No, no. You have to plan ahead. And life is the same way. So today we're going to talk about this. Number one, we're going to talk about being wise in what you do. Being wise in what you do. Colossians 4, 1 through 5 starts with a very controversial scripture, but I'm going to hit back, head back to that in just a minute. Number one, masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair because you know that you also have masters in heaven. Now, in our society, the way we would apply this would be to a boss. And in that society, it was basically talking about this idea that your slave is not any less than you. The Bible is not condoning slavery, which we're going to talk about in a minute. There's actually a book of the Bible that is only, the whole, the whole book is about releasing a slave, letting a slave go. But we'll talk about that in a minute. Devote yourselves to prayer. Would you say that you're devoted to prayer? Being watchful and thankful and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message now most of us know open door would be a nice thing for somebody who's under house arrest that he would open a door for his message why so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in change and then he says pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should and then it says this and I love this passage let's hang on to this passage verse 5 
Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. So I want you to hear this. Paul is talking to the early church. And every once in a while, somebody will say something like, you know, you really shouldn't be seeker sensitive. You shouldn't be sensitive to people who are unchurched. You should just have church, churches for Christians. You shouldn't be sensitive to other people. Paul and the Bible over and over, you can look at 1 Corinthians uh, 12 through 14. It talks about having unbelievers as part of church watching online with us. What should we do? We should be wise in the way we act towards them. If you're talking to somebody online, if you're having a conversation with somebody online, you shouldn't say, good luck in everlasting damnation. Uh, anybody who says that just shows me that they don't understand scripture. He says, make the most of every opportunity. Now, let me tell you something about opportunities. And if you don't hear anything else today, I hope you'll hear this. So tune in for just a minute. Uh, 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 don't look at your TV. Only look at your device today. Here's the deal. A crock pot has to be prepared ahead of time. And you have to get everything ready. And, and what I like to do is on Tuesdays, especially when I'm really, really busy, I like to get everything ready early in the morning so that when I get home, oh, the house smells so good. And I'm actually today going to share one of my recipes with you that I stole from online. But, but here's the thing. Life is like a crock pot. Life is like this crock pot. You can't wait. You can't wait in life and then decide all of a sudden you're going to do it. For example, if you want to spend time with your children, you can't say, well, when I have vacation, I'll spend time with them. You have to make investment after investment after investment. Here's the deal. If you don't have dinner with your family, you can't wait to the end of the month and then have 30 dinners together. It's just not going to work. Investments, just like a crock pot, have to take place over time. It's small interactions. Now listen, this is not only with your family, this is with other people. Do you want to have good friends? Do you want to know people and care about people? Do you want to show people you love them? Be wise. Get the crock pot ready. Make investments over time. Start it cooking. And everybody knows you let something sit in a crock pot, man, a potato in a crock pot will eventually just fall apart. You'll have potato mush by the time you're done. If you want to make a roast, you put a tough piece of meat in a crock pot and by the end of the day, it's softened up. Listen, when you're dealing with people, you have to recognize that it's investments over time. You can't just show up at their door, think you're going to present one message, and then that's going to just do it. The truth is we invest, we make the most of Every opportunity. So let me ask you this this week. Have you gone out of your way, first of all, to have opportunities and then to make the most of them? And we're going to talk about what that means in just a minute. So here's their first prayer for you today. Father, give me wisdom to do what you desire. Number two. So we're not only wise in what we do, we want to be wise in what we say. Now let me give you this this recipe that I use for so many things. I'm going to pull a few of these items out of here for you. So one of the things that you start with, if you're going to make this recipe, is you start with a lot of soy sauce. It's a, 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 some olive oil, which I didn't bring with me, and then, and then a, a cup of soy sauce. And then you have just a little, just a little Worcestershire sauce. I put garlic and onion. I got onion powder. And I put all those things together as I, as I make this. And, and the reason I do it, and I've got Italian seasoning, by the way, if you want, I'll, I'll actually send you the, the link for that recipe. But the truth is, when it comes to this idea of being wise in your friendships, or excuse me, when it comes to this idea of, of being wise in what you say, it's the balance. See, one time, see, I, I always use lots of soy sauce and a little Worcestershire sauce. One time I was away from home and I called home and I said to one of my family members, hey, can you make the, the sauce for the thing? I forgot to, to, I put the steak in, but I forgot to marinate it before I left. Can you do that? And they said, sure. And I told them how much soy sauce and I told them how much Worcestershire sauce. But they accidentally mixed up the ingredients, 
for the Worcestershire sauce and the soy sauce. Now, let me tell you, a lot of soy sauce makes it salty, but it's delicious. Worcestershire sauce, not so much. You put a cup of this on your steak and you will be eating the worst steak you've ever had. Listen to what the Bible says here in the next verse, verse 6. Paul says this, let your conversation always, now listen, listen, be full of soy sauce. Be full of grace. And then it says, seasoned with salt. So just a little worse to shear. Just a little goes a long way. Just a, a little salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. I'm going to talk about what salt did back then in a second. Tychus will tell you all the news about me. He's a dear brother. Now listen to these friendships that Paul developed. A faithful minister, a fellow servant of the Lord. I'm sending him to you. Why? So that you may know about our circumstances and he may encourage your hearts. So Paul had all these people, all these fellow Christians, and they had different jobs. They were there to encourage each other. My fellow uh, prisoner, Arstal, Ar, excuse me, Arsalus, sends his greetings as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. Now you remember Barnabas, that name meant son of encouragement. And then it says, you have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. And then it says, Jesus, who's called Justice, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my co-workers for the kingdom of God, and they have provided a comfort. Now listen, have you uh, proved a comfort? Have you, do you have somebody in your life that proves a comfort to me? That's verse 11. Have proved a comfort to me. We're missing a few words from that verse, but it says, they've proved a comfort to me. That word comfort that's in the Bible is, is, a, is a medical term. It means to bring comfort. Now, let me tell you about salt real quick. Listen, if you're supposed to be full of grace, seasoned with salt, the idea is your word should always be gracious. You know what grace means? Grace means that you assume the best about somebody. Years ago, I had a friend told, tell me something that I thought was awesome. He told his wife years ago, he said, Honey, if there are two thoughts you can have about something I say, and one of the thoughts is, well, he meant this, and the other thought is, he meant this, would you go with the first one? Would you just assume that I meant what was best? That's the idea of grace. Now, let me tell you what what salt did. It could preserve food back then. It would sterilize the food. Of course, we used to do this in America too, where we would pack things in salt uh, for the season. It was an antiseptic. And Paul uh, uh, used it, and it could also just season a food. If you just put a little salt on food. Now, I don't know if you've ever had the top of the salt shaker come off. We all have had that happen. We're going to make something, and all of a sudden that salt shaker comes off. And when we were kids, what did we do when we were in that store? We loosened that salt shaker lid. We should all be punished for that. So the next time that salt shaker lid comes off, just say, yeah, that's just me getting back what I did. And so what happens when you do that? It ruins the dish. Listen, some of us are so salty in what we say that it ruins the grace. Just sprinkle salt, just a little salt. Here's your next prayer. Father, give me words of grace and truth. So be wise in what you do. Be wise in what you say. Number three, be wise in your friendships. I got to go get one of my friends here. Bob, come on up here. I want to use you as an example. Now, I give Bob a hard time all the time. Even, even when we're separate, I, I'm giving Bob a hard time from a distance. Why? Because Bob and I have known each other for years. I visited Bob in the hospital when he was sick. Bob has visited me in the hospital when I'm sick. I visited Bob's house when he was doing well and when he was struggling. Bob has visited my house when I'm doing well and struggling. Bob came over one time with a pillow and said, Eric, if you ever get really sick and don't want to live anymore, just let me know. I'll bring this pillow. But I was a little worried because I thought maybe Bob wouldn't make sure that I really wanted to go. And if I nodded by accident, he might take me out. That's the kind of friend Bob is. Listen, you and I realize that in our lives, we've had those friends in our lives. And some of us have had friends that if we look back, we think, I wish I had never made friends with that person. I wish I had never been friends with that person in my life. And then other people that we look back and we think, I'm so glad. 
I, I've got three very special friends that I've had for many, many years. One has already gone on to be with the Lord. The other two, we don't talk that often now. We're far away from each other. One of them lives all the way across the country. And here's the deal. When we talk, we still recognize the investments from friendships. In Proverbs 22, verse 24 and 25, it says this. Do not make friends with a hot-tempered person. Do not associate with one easily angered, or you may learn their ways and get yourself ensnared. Now, vinegar is really good sometimes. You can use apple cider vinegar for all kinds of things. But if you want to ruin a crock pot dish, just take the top off of this vinegar, whatever you're making, and just dump it in there. You'll ruin everything. Listen, there are really smart people who have ruined their lives because they've hung around people who pulled them down. They've hung around people that pulled them away from the Lord. They've hung around people that have gotten them away from what God wants you to do. Listen, be careful who you make friends with. And listen, if you're a young person, I want you to know that friendships are some of the most important things you have. Be careful who you make friends with. But listen to what Paul talks. He talks about all these people, these friends who are there to encourage him. Epaphras, who's one of you and a servant of Christ, he sends greetings. I love this. He's always wrestling in prayer for you. Do you wrestle in prayer for other people? Do you ask God to bless them? Do you pray for your friends? Do you have a list of friends? You should have a list of your family and people who are close to you that you pray for every day. You can pray for other people too, but those people, so you can wrestle for them when they're struggling. It says he wrestles in prayer for you, what? That you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. And then he says, I vouch for him. He's working hard for you. And for those at Laodicea and Heropolis, our dear friend, Luke, the doctor, time out. So this Luke is the one that a lot of times people think is a disciple. Luke is not a disciple. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Luke is the one that's not a disciple. And Luke also wrote the book of Acts, and he's the doctor. So he tends to be the one that's more detailed. He brings out very specific details in the story of Jesus and in the book of Acts that we don't get from other authors. Why? Because he's a doctor. He's very specific. It would be like having an engineer, kind of, uh, who then writes a book. And so he writes a book of the Bible. And then it says, and Demas sends greetings. Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters of Laodicea and to Nympha and to the church in her house. After this letter has been read to you, see it's read in the church of Laodiceans, and then in turn read the letter from Laodicea. So this was called a circular letter. It was uh, sent out. And then it says, tell Agrippus, see to it that you complete the ministry you've received from the Lord. Do you have anybody who encourages you that way? Who goes out of their way to say, hey, I want to see you do and finish what God has called you to do. You know, we're getting near the end of the school year. We're getting near where, where kids, even though they have to, can't go back to school, they have to do virtual school. Where there's not the person in their face every day encouraging them. So there's a lot of kids right now who I will say to them, and you should say to them, hey, Finish what you started. You're almost done. The finish line is right there. Don't give up too early. Just these few weeks, do something that matters. Listen, those of you who are struggling with discouragement and depression, I want you to know that one of the biggest things that's absolutely true is sometimes right before a big breakthrough is when you're the most discouraged. Sometimes before things really changed is the time that you feel like nothing will ever change. So I want to encourage you. Hey, hang in there. Know that God has uh, uh, work for you. And then Paul says this. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Why? Because he had somebody else write the book for him. Apparently Paul couldn't see very well. And in a few places he says, I write really big so that I can see it. And then he says, remember my chains. And then he says, grace be with you. Are we giving grace to other people? I want to tell you about four friends. These four friends are Roy, three friends, Roy, Dave, and Charlie, and then myself. We all met for breakfast a little before 6 a.m. for years, and we would do what I had learned about from somebody else called soap. And we would sit down, and we would use the S. We would talk about Scripture. And then, oh, we would talk about outreach. Is there anybody you're praying for? Anybody you're reaching out to? Because we always have to remember to be outward focused. Who are we helping? Who are we leading? Who are we encouraging? So scripture, outreach, SOAP, S-O. And then A, accountability. How are you treating those closest to you? 
What's your biggest struggle this week? And then sometimes we would say, and what are you lying to me about or afraid to tell me? And that's accountability. We just sat down with each other, not to berate each other, but just to be there. Hey, how can I help you in this? And finally, P for prayer. We prayed for each other. For years we did this. We met once a week for breakfast early in the morning down at Melbourne at a place called Pops Casbah, which was there. We met in the back corner and we would do soap, scripture, outreach, accountability, and prayer. What did that do? It seasoned our lives. It flavored our lives. It changed how it tastes. Listen, listen, you can, you can make a steak in a crock pot with no other ingredients and it will be okay. But you add a few ingredients. You let other people pour into your life. When they pour the right things in your life, avoid those people who pour the wrong thing. Those bitter people, those angry people, those people who, who run you away from God, who pull you towards sin. Watch out for those people. But allow those people who are the seasoning and salt of your life to come into your life and allow God to change you and change me. If you want to live a life that matters, if you want to make the most of life, you have to be wise in what you do, what you say, and in the friends you choose. And if you devote your life to Christ, he will make a huge difference. There's a great prayer at the end of this message. I think I had one more challenge here that I didn't have in my notes. Father, help me to choose friends who help me grow. And pray that for your kids and pray that for your friends, that you would be that friend that helps them grow. Now, here's a final prayer. Did it make the notes today? If not, it's okay. I'll just pray it. It's okay. Don't worry about it, Randy. I'm just going to pray it here. Oh, here it is. Father, and you can pray this with me. Father, make me wise in the things that I do and in the choices that I make. Lord, keep a guard on my mouth and help me to say things that build others up. Fill me with your grace and your truth. Father, help me to choose friends that push me towards you. Lord, help me to move away from friends who pull me from you. Lord, thank you, Lord, for friends who inspire and encourage me. Help me to be fully devoted to you in every aspect of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, here's what I want to tell you about life. So often, life is about the choices you make. You can't wait to the end of life and think it's going to matter. Listen, you've got to start early in life. Day-by-day day choices, adding the ingredients, the grace, the truth, spending time in God's word, allowing God to change your life, to add things to your life that you've never had, to, to, to season you with friends who love you, to avoid those people who lead you away, to have just a little bit of salt in your life where God is purifying your heart and your mind and seasoning you to be a different person. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, the first step to having the right ingredients is to allow God to change you. And how do you do that? You say, Jesus, I want to surrender my life to you. Father, I know that you died for me and rose again, and I want to surrender my life to you. I want to make you Lord. I want to put you in charge of my life. I know that you live for me, and I surrender my life to you. And if you pray that prayer and you really mean it, you mean, God, I really want to surrender my life to you. I know you died and rose again. And if you surrender your life to him, that's what it means to be a Christian. And if you've been a Christian for a long time, but the truth is, maybe you've allowed bad friends in your life. Or maybe you've had way too much of parts of your life or way, you're way too salty. Then begin to say, God, would you make me the kind of person you want me to be in the things that I do, in the things that I say, and in the friends that I choose. Let's close in prayer today. I want to encourage you to give what God's put on your heart. You can give during this time. You can give online. You can drop off uh, uh, here at the church. We have a drop box. I encourage you to give during this time. This time is difficult for many churches, including ours. And so any amount you can give would be a big help to our church. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Father, thank you for each one that's watched today. I pray that you would bless them. Father, I pray that we could be a blessing to others. I pray this afternoon as we go and do a love wave for somebody that we love, that they would know that they're not alone even though they're shut in. And Father, I pray too that we would know we're not alone because you are with us. So Father, 